Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I'm Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to have you here today at the college and welcome to some of our visitors. I know we have visitors in the audience. Uh, some of you may know that the McFarland Center takes a special interest in exploring the many forms and facets of religious practice in diverse cultures around the world. We do that in particular through a research initiative on global Catholicism called Catholics and Cultures, as well as through programs that explore other religious traditions. I'm really delighted today to be welcoming a speaker who is exceptionally well equipped to help us think about religious content experience in one context, albeit a very big and diverse context in and of itself in Africa. Before I do that, forgive me if I make a little pitch for Catholics and Cultures and the initiative we do. Uh, the initiative Catholics and Cultures is dedicated to publishing what we learn in an open access format using two different on online means. One, a multimedia website, catholicsandcultures.org. If the students haven't looked at it yet, uh, I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, the site continues to grow. There are 27 countries represented there. Uh, more than 500,000 page views a year and a few hundred thousand YouTube views uh, per year now. Uh, two of the entries that are featured on there are in Ethiopia and Uganda were in fact ones that were facilitated by our guest speaker today and I'm grateful to him for that. Catholics and Cultures also sponsors an online scholarly journal, the Journal of Global Catholicism, uh, which Professor Matt Schmaltz serves as founding editor. Unfortunately, he's sick today, not with us. Uh, but among the first two issues of the journal, were two on Catholicism in Africa. So I hope some of you will want to look at that at holycross.ed, catholicsandcultures.org slash journal. I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that today's talk is sponsored by uh, one of the Deitchman family lectures on religion and modernity. We're grateful to John Deitchman of the class of 1970 for his generosity that makes it possible for us to be here. So that's a bigger wind up than I usually uh, go for an introduction but I can promise that today's speaker is well worth it. Uh, he's one of the world's more prominent Jesuits, uh, sought out around the world as a speaker, and I also say with great admiration, he's a really kind and generous soul. Uh, Father Abaniameke Arobator is a native of Nigeria. He's the president of the Jesuit Conference of Africa and Madagascar. Before that, from 2009 to 2014, he served as provincial superior of the Jesuits in the East African province which includes Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan. He was principal of Hakima University College Jesuit School of Theology and Institute of Peace Studies and International Relations in Nairobi, Kenya, a campus college at the Catholic University of East Africa. He also serves as a trustee at Georgetown University. Father Robotor's research focuses on theological ethics and ecclesiology in the global south. He's author of Theology Brewed with an in an African Pot, published in 2008, editor of Reconciliation, Justice, and Peace, the Second African Synod, published in 2011. He's co-editor with Linda Logan of Feminist Catholic Theological Ethics, Conversation in the World Church, published in 2014, and editor of The Church We Want, African Catholics Look at Vatican III published in 2016. His most recent book is Religion and Faith in Africa, Confessions of an Animist. His talk today, which will certainly help frame what we do, draws from that. It's titled, Of Ancient Deities and Modern Gods, Making Sense of the Promises and Pathologies of Religion in Africa and Faith in Africa. So please join me in welcoming uh, Robotar. Thank you very much. On Saturday, April 2nd, 1983, I was formally received as a convert into the Roman Catholic Church. The venue was the parish church of St. Joseph, which at the time had existed for about three decades. St. Joseph's was founded by Irish missionaries of St. Patrick's Society for the Foreign Missions, also known as the Kiltigan Fathers. But actually, Jesuits of the New York province would rightly take credit 
for my baptism and eventual entry into religious life. Conversion to Catholicism marked a turning point rather than the beginning of a spiritual odyssey. For there was a time when I was not a Christian. The immediate, the immediate surrounding of my upbringing was imbued by manifest religiosity. And this was evidenced by several altars and, and shrines mounted on every corner of the house where I grew up and each one dedicated to a coterie of gods and goddesses, ancestral spirits, and ancient deities. Religion was a daily family and communal affair. It was deeply rooted in our collective psyche. Upon waking, rituals were performed and in the course of the day, many more would occur. The purpose is varied from protection to propitiation and from supplication to, in some instances, imprecation. The gods and goddesses held sway over people's activities, endeavors, and enterprises in private and in public life. So if you could imagine that scene that I just painted, that was the scenario when missionaries arrived in West Africa in the 19th century. The missionaries did not come alone or unaided. They either followed or were followed by colonial administrators and adventurers, bounty hunters and intrepid explorers. Theirs was a mutually re reinforcing enterprise that resorted routinely to arms and ammunition, guns and alcohol, and, of course, to the Bible, to achieve their objectives as occasions and circumstances demanded. Interestingly, the early missionaries in West Africa concent concentrated their evangelical effort in converting local leaders to Christianity. Now, considering the dual functions of local leaders as political authorities vested with religious powers, the logic of missionary Christianity expected the conversion of such leaders to trigger mass conversion of entire communities. Historically, though, examples of total and complete conversion were few and far between. Exception made, for example, of the monarchs of the Congo Kingdom in Central Africa, many traditional rulers maintained ambiguous religious affiliation. The expediency of political and, in some instances, military supremacy over rivals necessitated nominal conversion to Christianity. A Christian king was a more trusted ally of the colonial administrators, understandably. Yet, the depth of allegiance to ancestral deities relativized, in many ways, the influence of foreign religions. By the time, for example, the British punitive expedition sacked and ransacked the ancient city of Benin, my place of birth, in 1889, there was a spattering of missionary presence that had been established all across sub-Saharan Africa. Over the next few decades, that presence continued to grow, not as substitute for ancient forms of worship, but in the minds of the people as some kind of supplement or complement. For example, my father, as a staunch practitioner of African religion, worshipped at the Central Baptist Church at Ring Road on Sunday. 
there's no evidence that he was ever baptized. But he was there every Sunday. For the missionaries, in this case the Baptists, for them, the congregation that counted in its ranks, leading men of the community, was proof of evangelical prowess and success. In reality, though, the allegiance of local worshippers of my father's status was tenuous and superficial. For, prim for primacy of allegiance belonged to African religion, not to Christianity or Islam. Quite clearly, in Africa, south of the Sahara, before the advent of Christianity, the religious landscape was already quite well densely populated by a phalanx of deities and spiritual beings which underpinned a firmly established tradition and practice of religiosity. Now, while the scholars baptized this tradition, African traditional religion, missionary, missionary vocabulary drew on a wide range of derogatory terms to characterize it. For missionaries and colonial scholars of religion, whatever the Africans practice did not attain the threshold of respectability to be considered and designated as religion. Accordingly, in their estimation, the African in his or her natural state practiced magic, sorcery, witchcraft, paganism, Satanism, idolatry, and animism. On my mother's baptismal certificate, which was issued in 1957, the column for former religion in case of adult was boldly inscribed with the word heathenism. Whatever the label or epithet, appended to our ancient ways of worshiping and believing. None adequately plumbed the depths of this tradition, nor articulated the fundamental values and principles contained therein. Take the term animism or animist, for example. Still, to this day, a favorite of anthropologists, historians, and journalists when they describe religious affiliation and practice in Africa outside of Christianity and Islam. In my experience, animism appeals to the inherent worth of every part of creation. At the core of this religious practice and consciousness, routinely disparaged by adherents of so-called world religions, lies a deep belief in the livingness of creation. In other words, this tradition represents a profound and intense belief that there is inner invisible power in anything at any given moment. Now, if you transpose this into the words of Pope Francis in his encyclical Laudato Si, this means, quote, that each each creature has its own purpose. None is superfluous. Soil, water, mountains, everything as it were, is a caress of God. End of quote. From my recollection, and as I continue to draw inspiration from this religious tradition, Pope Francis comes the closest to offering an honest and just representation of African religion considered as animism. Thus, to apply animism to African religion in a pejorative sense, as the missionaries did, would appear to me as erroneous and disingenuous at best, but also malicious and dangerous at worst. Now, I do not intend by this assertion to imply that African religion functions in pristine, 
and untarnished spaces. Like other religions, it is susceptible to the machinations of charlatans and bigots and usurpers of divine authority. People, according to Nigerian Nobel, Nobel laureate for literature, Wole Shoinka, adept at co-opting deities to lend credence to their human sentiments and proclivities. I will offer some concrete examples of aberrations later on. Yet, unlike, unlike what we are used to calling world religions, African religion shies away from proselytization and militancy. It discountenances guile and coercion as instruments of religious conversion. African religion is neither aspirational nor doctrinal. It promises no miraculous transformation of a person's fortune, nor does it develop, preserve, and transmit, inviolate a body of credo tenets from generation to generation. Its promises depend solely and entirely on the favor of the gods and goddesses, bestowed principally according to their design, regardless of the pretension of any religious expert. In this sense, African religion is first and foremost a way of life, rather than a system of codified dogma and doctrine. This life unfolds in a spiritual space it is sustained by unwritten codes of practice, illustrated in oral folk tales, embodied in mystery, rooted in transcendence and immanence, and expressed through ritual and worship, myths and narratives, ethics and norms. Now, notwithstanding this deeply embedded tradition of religious consciousness, Africa has known religious conversion aplenty, Islam and Christianity being the principal beneficiaries. Now, to focus just on only one of these two traditions, the astronomical growth of Christianity in sub-Saharan Africa qualifies as some kind of evangelical statistical miracle. The numbers don't lie. By one estimation, in a relatively short period of 100 years, from 1910 to 2010, Christianity in sub-Saharan Africa recorded a 70-fold increase in membership from 7 million to 470 million. Now, the methods of computation of these statistics may vary, but they converge essentially on one conclusion, that is, the phenomenal rise of Christianity in Africa. Numerical growth and progress also translates into proliferation of churches across the continent. The enticing prospect and promise of an abundance of souls to be won necessitates the rapid expansion rapid expansion of the special capacity to accommodate converts. Unlike historical precedents, the preferred religious architecture of modern-day African evangelists prioritizes megachurches and amphitheaters, as well as denominational franchises that span countries and regions and even continents. On the face of it, the manifest design and purpose of missionary Christianity to dethrone the ancient deities of Africa has succeeded beyond the wildest imagination and expectation of the 19th century heralds of Christianity. In their stead, missionaries and their evangelical forebears enthroned the God of Jesus Christ. Now, along with the tradition of Islam, Christian tradition has struck a deep root in Africa. And the poignant declaration of Paul VI to a pan-African gathering of religious leaders half a century ago 
would appear to have been fulfilled. Paul, in 1969, said, and I quote, By now, you Africans are missionaries to yourselves. The Church of Christ is well and truly planted in this blessed soil. End of quote. Now, this blessed soil is the fertile religious soil of Africa in which the seeds of Christianity and Islam were sown. Over the centuries, these seeds took root and flourished, undoubtedly along with some weeds, as I shall point out. Christianity counts the fruit of these long-sown seeds in millions of converts and believers. And as these seeds grow into trees, fruit is produced and nourished by roots that reach down into the blessed soil of Africa. And this blessed soil, I argue, is African religion. In its diversity, variety, and multiplicity, the explosion of Christian religious denominations in modern-day Africa is, is explained in part by history, but I would say due largely to the ingenuity and creativity of African Christian. And I shall return to this phenomenon in a short while. But here is what I find truly intriguing from my experience in both religious traditions. Intriguing about the presumed dethronement of the ancient deities of Africa by the modern gods of Christianity and Islam. Many, many Africans have become adept at combining religious beliefs, practices, and purposes. Because the ancient deities operated on the basis of functionality, that is, their relevance to the present circumstances and conditions of their adherents, Christians and Muslims do not shy away from combining the presumed potency and benefits of respective deities with their familiar gods and goddesses to achieve maximum result. Analysis of this combinatory um, approach or phenomenon range from the more accommodating theories of hybridity and mixing to the less flattering critical positions that denounces it as a kind of a faith schizophrenia. Whatever the preferred label, the truth remains that the African believer is a subject of multiple religious identities, wherein ancient deities exist in tandem with modern gods. The relative strength of the constitutive identities is a function of the material need of the adherent. One of the characters of my favorite novel, Chinua Achebe's classic, Things Fall Apart, explained this phenomenon in plain language on the occasion of a theological debate with a European missionary. He said, and I quote, you say there is one supreme God who made heaven and earth? We also believe in him. In fact, we call him Chuku. He made all the world and the other gods so that we can approach him through them. Chuku appoints the smaller gods to help him because his work is too great for one person. We make sacrifices to the little gods, but when they fail and there is no one else to turn, we go to Chuku. It is right to do so. We approach a great man through his servants, but when his servants fail to help us, we go to the last source of hope. We appear to pay greater attention to the little gods, but that is not so. We worry them more because we are afraid to worry their master." End of quote. Now, my tendency to uphold the continued relevance and significance of African religion and its survival in the face of a frontal attack unleashed by missionary Christianity is not intended to undermine in any shape or form the contribution of Christianity to the continent of Africa. 
To take one example and to put it simply, missionary Christianity has nursed and educated Africa, especially south of the Sahara. In some instances, estimates indicate that to this day, churches and affiliated church-based organizations provide up to 60% of Africa's health care and educational needs, not to mention charitable and humanitarian uh, initiatives. However, while such promises and prospects of religion continue to promote the dignity of the human person in Africa and contribute to human flourishing, it can no longer be plausibly maintained with absolute certainty that religion in Africa is immune to the signs of pathological dysfunctionality and the perversion and distortion of its core proposition. I hasten to add that Africa is not an exception because there are varying levels of pathological manifestations elsewhere in the world. So let me speak of religious pathologies. When I use the term religious pathologies, I have a very clear understanding of what I mean. For what concerns Christianity, I mean by it the tendency to invent Christology on the basis of a reductionist mindset that just opposes good and evil and then reduces the function, role, and meaning of the entire teaching of the gospel of Christ to a weapon for opposing, taming, and defeating evil incarnated in a set of malevolent spirits. Besides, it lays an undue stress on the functionality of this gospel to procure everything that is presuppose, it presupposes is denied or opposed by evil spirits, essentially prosperity in form of wealth and health. Accordingly, accordingly, Jesus Christ becomes primarily and exclusively the prized purveyor of material prosperity and the great guarantor of victory against the ubiquitous and marauding evil spirits. Now, such simplistic theologies, I argue, are prone to pathological manifestations, especially in three distinct area of activities of modern day evangelical Christianity in Africa. The first area is in healing, particularly miraculous healing. The second is prophecy or visions relating to material well-being, conditions, and fortunes or misfortunes of followers. And the third is deliverance, that is the need to neutralize and eliminate forces that are perceived to stand in the way of the socioeconomic advancement of adherents. In my estimation, the spread of religious pathologies puts people's lives at risk. It puts people's lives at risk and compounds Africa's modern day problems and challenges. And I know that when I make this claim it is controversial, especially to those who are minded to have a more positive valuation of religion and faith in Africa. And in this context, therefore, to illustrate the point I make about the potential of religious pathologies to pose great danger to people's lives, I would like to make these three considerations. First, although renowned for its predilection for vibrant and joyful praise and worship, Christianity in Africa, as I say it, is primarily, though not exclusively, a religion of the poor. Now, if you're Pope Francis, you may rejoice and perceive in this assertion a fulfillment of a genuine desire for a church of the poor, by the poor, and for the poor. In reality, however, religious opportunists 
and there are many of them, and entrepreneurs have perfected the art of preying on the gullibility and desperation of the impoverished and disenfranchised people, millions of whom aspire desperately for miraculous financial and material success. Their promised redemption or benediction measured in material terms can be procured only at the cost of offerings and tithes and gifts to spiritual leaders and a consumption of a vast popular literature and other spiritual products created by pastors and ministers. It's my first point. The second point regarding the dangers of religious pathologies is that Christianity in Africa is also a religion of the wealthy. It serves an, as an effective means of safeguarding the wealth of adherents because what is abundantly reaped as a fruit of faith must be vigorously protected against dark, sinister, satanic forces centuries-old ancestral curses, and so much else for which, in fact, Afghan religion is falsely accused and vilified. Thus, sowing, reaping, and preservation of wealth becomes the specialty of Christian churches, particularly those denominations that take pride in their specialization in prosperity gospel. My third consideration, if poverty and wealth, as I've just mentioned, drive worshippers in droves into the fold of religious groups, albeit for differing purposes, it is not hard to guess who are the principal beneficiaries of the promises and prospects of Christianity in modern day Africa. Modern-day Christianity has made some of the wealthiest and ostentatious evangelists, prophets, overseers, pastors, effectively CEOs who preside over sprawling empires of religious production, whose returns are measured in multiples of millions of dollars. Several African men of God, men of God, for they are almost always men, dominate Forbes' list of the richest pastors in the world. And the last time I checked, the list includes the likes of Nigerian preacher David Oyedipo, founder and presiding pastor of Winner's Chapel, valued at 150 million US dollars. Malawian prophet Shepard Bushiri, founder of the Enlightened Christian Gathering Church, valued at under 150 million. Nigerian pastor Enoch Adeboye, who has the redeemed Christian Church of God, valued at 55 million. And the very popular Nigerian prophet T.B. Joshua, founder of the Synagogue of Church of All Nations, valued at 15 million. Now, if in, in my account or narrative, I speak critically of pathologies of religion and faith in Africa, my position is informed by the potential of such pathologies to carry not only deception, but more crucially, its potential for stunting the development of an entire continent. It troubles me not to say that religion can, and in many instances has become, an obstacle to socioeconomic development on this continent. And here, the reason I make this argument stems from the tendency of its proponents to spiritualize Africa's, Africa's challenges and problems while proposing ridiculous nostrums as solutions, solutions that I believe make a mockery of the prophetic energy 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if we follow the lead of uh, Emeritus Pope Benedict XVI and claim that secularism in its various forms, especially atheism and relativism, constitute the principal adversary of venerable Christian principles in the West, the picture changes dramatically when we shift focus of analysis to the context of Africa. You see, the question whether or not God has a place in the public realm does not arise on the continent, as I believe my narrative shows. What seems to defy logic, at least the way I say it, and require explanation is not the crisis of faith or the absence of religion. Rather, it is the ubiquity and pervasiveness of religion on the continent. So, quote Benedict, if, quote, development needs Christians with their arms raised towards God in prayer, end of quote, then I would add, Africa possesses the advantage of numbers and public exhibition of religiosity. The irony, however, lies in the fact that in Africa, the fortunes of religious affiliation and practice flourish, flourish abundantly, in inverse proportion, in inverse, in, in inverse proportion to the continent's economic, social, and political misfortunes. And as I have pointed out, the demographics of religious affiliation constitutes the subject of glowing assessments of the astronomic, astronomical growth of Christianity in Africa. So when I ask the question of the relevance of faith to development, I do it not from the perspective of the lack of faith, but precisely because the benefit of development remains elusive in the face of religious effervescence in Africa. Why is that so? In the context of Africa, the argument that values positively the contribution of Christianity and other religions to development cannot be assumed a priori and axiomatically. Besides religious fundamentalism, several reasons can be adduced for questioning the relevance of religion as practiced presently on the continent. It's, relevant, it's, it's relevance to, de to development. And I say this with the background of the pathologies that I have referred to. I have mentioned already, for example, the phenomenon of the gospel of prosperity in several parts of Africa, equating faith with prosperity by claiming that such equation guarantees divine benediction in form of material success, wealth, facility, health, social status, irrespective of prevalent contextual considerations. Here, I believe, is one area that could benefit from the principles of Catholic social teaching and the structural causes of poverty, such as the negation of human rights, corruption, and the assault on the dignity of the human person by unjust socioeconomic and political arrangements. In my assessments, these are considerations that some religious expressions would consider quite contrary and strange to the gospel. The situation in Africa demonstrates that divorced from such ethical framework, Religion resembles a dangerous tool capable of retarding permanently the development of peoples. In light of this provision of religion as a factor of Africa's underdevelopment, the inventory of pathologies not only appears ridiculous, more importantly, it is patently dangerous. And there is no sh shortage of illustrations of this dangerous trend across the continent. I think, for example, of Paseka Matsuneng 
a self-styled South African prophet and leader of the Church of Incredible Happenings. And that's the true title of his church, the Church of Incredible Happenings, whose track record of amazing feats includes a putative trip to heaven to take selfies using his smartphone. And not only that, a peek, just a peek at his photo album of heaven would set his followers back 340 US dollars apiece. Now, not to be outdone by the otherworldly stance of a peer, another South African pastor, Alf Lukau of Alleluia Ministries Church, performed what he called a tsunami of miracles by claiming to resurrect a dead man at his own funeral and posting the picture on social media. Pastor Lethebo Rabalago of Mount Zion General Assembly sprays insecticide into the faces of his followers, ostensibly to cure them of all ailments, including HIV and AIDS. And we could continue with Prophet Lesego Daniel of Rabuni Ministries, who instructs his congregation to drink petrol and eat grass and flowers. Or even more spectacularly, self-proclaimed prophet Penuel Mguni of End Time Disciples Ministries, who feeds his followers stones that he claimed to have turned into bread, and snakes and rats that he claims are turned into chocolate. You see, these are for me extreme manifestations of religious pathologies but also, sadly, some of the most celebrated as examples of the growth of religion and faith on the continent. Earlier in my presentation, I hinted that African religion was not devoid of pathologies. And these pathologies are founded on the ignorance and falsification of its core values by the supposed interpreters, overseers, and enforcers of its precepts. Again, to give but a few examples, in the name of African religion, thousands of women across West Africa, principally, have been enslaved by centuries-old practice where girls are forced to live and work with priests in shrines, some for the rest of their lives, to pay for the sins of family members. In the Ghanaian village of Manfe Dove, Pregnant women are not allowed to deliver in the village because it is believed that it will offend the gods. The result is that some expectant mothers make treacherous journeys in excruciating pain to avoid breaking this tradition. Also, in another part of Ghana, the central region of Ghana, in the Nkira East District, on the orders of a local guard, schoolgirls have been forbidden to cross a river while they are menstruating and on Tuesdays. This outrageous injunction means that girls miss out on education as they must cross the river to reach school. Such blatant violation of girls' right to education compounds the situation in sub-Saharan Africa where countries fail to keep girls in school because they are menstruating. Again, another set of examples illustrating pathologies of religious affiliation on the continent. Now, these examples notwithstanding, I believe I will be remiss in my task this afternoon to leave you with the impression that pathologies dominate the narratives of Africa's historical and modern day experience of religion and faith. Far from it. And I would add happily, there are, there are, there is an abundance of signs of prophetic practice. That is the manifestations of which exemplify and embody the authentic meaning and purpose of religion and faith. Like those specimens of pathological performance, the exemplars of religion as prophetic practice are of varying background, personality, 
and religious affiliation. And the motivation for their exemplary practice does not derive necessarily from confessional commitment or the imperative of a religious vocation. These are women and men who believe profoundly in the dignity of the human person and the duty to protect this dignity for all peoples and for all times. And I would also give an account of a few examples. The first African woman to be honored with the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, Wangari Mathai, was recognized for her contribution to sustainable development, democracy, and peace. According to the Nobel Committee, she stood, quote, at the front of the fight to promote ecologically viable social, economic, and cultural development in Kenya and in Africa. She has taken a holistic approach to sustainable development that embraces democracy, human rights, and women's rights in particular. She thinks globally and acts locally." End of quote. Now, for his part, Dennis Mukwege, another African Nobel laureate for peace, was duly recognized, along with Nadia Murad, for their efforts to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war and armed conflict. And that is in the context of a protracted civil war that has claimed six million lives in Congo. According to the Norwegian Nobel Committee, quote, Dennis Mukwege is the most important and unifying symbol, the most important and unifying symbol, both nationally and internationally, of the struggle to end sexual violence in war and armed conflict. Dennis Mukwege is the helper who has devoted his life to defending these victims. Nadia Murad is the witness who tells of the abuses perpetrated against herself and others. End of quote. Now, on the face of it, there is no obvious reason which commends the lives of these two contemporary Africans, Wangari Mathai and Dennis Mukwege, for considerations in matters of religion and faith. After all, neither of them is a woman or man of God in the confessional sense of the term. Neither of them commands mass followership of the kind credited to some populist merchants of pathological performance of religion. Yet, I am convinced that these two Africans, Mukwege and Mathai, represent, exemplify, and embody the authentic meaning and purpose of religious belief and practice regarding the protection of the dignity of the human person and the care of creation. And furthermore, their lives offer resources for reviving authentically African values, such as espoused by African religion. To these two examples, I would like to add Burundian Marguerite Barankitse, who has devoted her life to the task of bridging atavistic ethnic divide and reconciling mortal enemies long separated by mutual hatred, prejudice, and antagonism with compassion and with love. I think also of CNN Heroes Award winner Sister Rosemary Nyumbe, of St. Monica's Tailoring School in Gulu, Uganda, and Angelina Atiam, also of Gulu, Uganda, who are creating new opportunities for children brutalized and traumatized by rebel insurgency and government recklessness. I think also of the 2013 UN Nansen Refugee Award recipient, Sister Angelique Namaika in DRC, DR Congo, whose personal and religious vocation is to rescue, rebuild, and restore the dignity of women victims of violence and war. I think as well of Bishop Paride Taban, Emeritus Bishop of Torit in South Sudan, 
founder of Holy, Holy Trinity Peace Village in Kuron, South Sudan, an oasis of peace, justice, and reconciliation in a country convulsed and devastated by civil war. Or recently of Sister Ola Tracy, principal of Loreto Girls School in Rumbek, South Sudan, a recipient of the International Women of Courage Award at the U.S. Department of State for exceptional courage, strength, and leadership in acting to bring positive change to South Sudan, often at great risk to her person. Now, I could continue and multiply the example, but my point is, unlike specimens of pathological performance, the prophetic practice inspired by each and every one of these personality does not, is not founded on the exploitation and manipulation of others. I began this presentation with a confession that I have not always been a Christian. Long before my formal reception into the Roman Catholic Church, I had been nourished body and soul by ritual practice and worship dedicated to ancestral deities. With the coming of Christianity and Islam, these ancient deities of African religion did not retreat into irrelevance. Given this reality, like me, I believe that there is no African who can claim to be solely and entirely Christian or Muslim. For to be a Christian or Muslim on this continent is to accept a hyphenated and multipolar identity. It is to contain a plurality of identities anchored in a universe of meaning and intersecting parts of knowledge, of wisdom, imagination, and consciousness. And so looking into the future, in light of these pathologies and prophetic performance that I've just outlined, whether dominated by Christianity or Islam, or less so overtly by African religion, for good or for ill, prophetically or pathologically, I believe that religion will continue to play a significant part in affecting and shaping and influencing the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the people of the African continent, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted. Thank you for your kind attention. Yes, I'll be happy to uh, take uh, questions and comments and reactions. And, and the, yeah, there are, there are um, I would say, some very um, fairly established popular expressions of piety. Uh, just to stay within the uh, Christian Catholic tradition, um, across the continent, especially south of the Sahara, there are several devotions based on Ma Marian apparitions. Uh, that are very strong. Um, I have with me here my colleague um, uh, Marcel from Rwanda. He can tell us about Our Lady of Kibeho, um, which is a very strong um, a, a presence in that part of Africa. But if you go elsewhere on the continent, West Africa, for example, that I'm familiar with, very strong, uh, popular uh, devotions to different presumed um, uh, locales of uh, apparitions. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Organized pilgrimages. Yes, organized pilgrimages to these sites. And of course, you know, think of one of the biggest pilgrimage sites of Africa is uh, Namgongo in Uganda. I think uh, Tom will be familiar with that. Uh, very strong pilgrimage site. But you see, let me let me let me add what I think is very interesting. In terms of popular devotions and piety and practices, there's a, a, a great deal of intersection across denominations now. Um, 
one of the things I discovered recently, so I called my mother, and, and we're talking on the phone, and I noticed that she's not really responsive, and I'm wondering what's going on here. Um, her answers are just kind of short, and, and, and she doesn't seem to want to engage in a conversation, so I let her be. And I found out later that she was on a prayer line, she said. And what's a prayer line? She was on the phone with, I don't know how many women across the globe. All of them connected to a pastor in Nigeria who spends an entire hour with all of them online taking prayer requests, responding to them, saying prayers. And this has become a very... Um, um, a very intense moment of connection, of devotion, and I'd imagine not only for her, but for so many who are on this prayer line. You know, that's more intangible than you know, more explicit um, devotional expressions, but it's also a function of um, how developments, you know, uh, say technological developments also creates such moments of devotion um, that connects. Again, she's not on a prayer line with only Catholic women. She's on a prayer line with women all over the world from all kinds of um, backgrounds in terms of de uh, denominations, in terms of um, ecclesial affiliation. So there's, there's, a, that, there's a completely liberalized space for devotional connection, um, which I found very, very interesting. You know? But thank you very much for your question. Please, Father. When you spoke of African religion, it occurred to me some extent the Hinduism and indigenous religion in India. I want to know, we in India, the effort being made to inculturate, integrate the elements of other religions, especially Hinduism, not what you call moral but social elements into our Christianity. I want to know would such efforts I'm sure being done in African continent as well. So I'm interested to know how you integrate indigenous, local, religious, cultural elements into Catholic Christian religious practices. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I didn't talk about that because again that's enculturation. Uh, it's a whole um, big, vast, extensive area. And again, uh, Marcel can tell you more about that because that's related to the subject of his doctoral dissertation at Boston College. Um, but the reality is that is, um, it is a movement which started after the Second Vatican Council and which has continued the movement of enculturation. That is an attempt to root Christianity in the context, in the values, in the practices of indigenous religion, which I called African religion. Um, I would say that's a movement that has undergone several phases. Post-Vatican II, there was so much about, oh, there was this um, interesting video that came out, the dancing church. So it was trying to incorporate such external manifestations like singing and um, like, like colors and, and music and dance and instrumentation. But I think over several de decades of practice, you know, there's been much progress beyond such movements so that the question now is really about what are the values, what are the principles of these indigenous religious practices that align with um, the values of Christianity, for example. And so whereas the missionaries would have said, well, we banned drummings because that's an instrument of, uh, of, uh, of, of the devil, so there'll be no drummings in our church. We'd only use organs. Now we've moved beyond that. Uh, I spoke a lot about, uh, well, I didn't speak a lot about it because I do that in the book itself that, uh, that Tom referred to. The ecological credentials of African religion, which I believe represents one very fertile area for enculturation, for example. You know, um, 
the 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 very strong um, value that is put on community, which I believe has been the source of theological reflection around models of the church, for example, as family, as communion. So at these levels, what I would say more theological levels, there are certainly um, examples and initiatives at enculturation. But again, that, that, that will be the subject of, uh, of a fascinating conversation because it's, it's, a, it's a vast area. Yeah, thank you very much, Father. At, at many levels, I would say there is dialogue and there's, there's need for dialogue. When we talk about dialogues, usually um, the tendency is to exclude African religions because we say, well, who are your dialogue partners? They don't, they're no dialogue partners, you see. Maybe there is some truth to that, but the reality is more than just the question of saying, who are your dialogue partners, there's also the question of attitude. In situations where uh, respectability is not accorded one religious um, tradition, that's already problematic. When you don't recognize a tradition on the same equal terms, that's already problematic. But the dialogues that exist tend to be at levels uh, I would say at um, contextual, uh, contextual, restricted to particular context and around specific issues. I think, for example, of West Africa, when you think of the whole uh, tension between Islam and Christianity, leading to some very uh, dramatic, explosive situations like the situation of Boko Haram, for example, there are structured attempts to create some kind of dialogue between Muslims and Christians. I know that is happening. Or you think, for example, of Central Africa Republic between the uh, Seleka and the Antibalaka, very uh, devastating um, bloodletting between militias that claim religious uh, justification, Christian and Islam, um, for what they do. There are structured dialogue I think of Cardinal Zampalaga and uh, Muslim and uh, Protestant uh, leaders creating dialogues around these situations. I think, for example, of, uh, of, um, of uh, South Sudan and the ongoing tension and the dialogue that is created by the South Sudan Council of Churches that brings together what were in factions from different religious expressions. So there are those moments um, taking place. Uh, but in terms of structured formal uh, conversations um, on theological platforms. Uh, I'm minded to think that that is not as developed. And I'm not, I don't think that that's actually uh, the best approach to it. Uh, we know of the dialogues in terms of the level of the global church, ACIC, for example. Um, I don't know that, that those will be effective means on a continent like Africa. I think those structured attempts around specific contexts and issues tend to be quite successful. But again, the need is there. I think for me, the question would be, what is the pretension of the religious expert in this context? And what I mean by that is, as a, as a religious functionary, because that's who I am, do I um, two things. Do I pay attention to the context in which this problem is emerging? If someone is sick and not getting the care he or she needs, why is that the case? It's not simply because this person doesn't have the means to access care, because there is a whole structural framework that makes accessibility and even the existence of care uh, impossible. So my question would be, do I pay attention to that, even as I respond pastorally to this person? The second thing for me is, and this is where I think the pathological question comes in, do I begin to use this as an opportunity to exploit for personal gains and benefit. 
You see, I think those are the two considerations that I would bring into the equation and say that I firmly believe that it is God's desire and dream and will that we, we uh, enjoy health and well-being and human flourishing. And I strongly believe that I have a role in making that possible. But I also think that part of that role, our responsibility, is to ensure that in exercising my duty of care, I am not at the same time exploiting people with their points of vulnerability, and I am not turning a deaf or blind eye to structures in society that aggravate if they, even if they don't cause that aggravate situations of people in, 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 in such moments of vulnerability. Yeah. And I think that's where I, I speak of pathology. Because when I look at the responses that some men of God propose, um, you know, I, I mentioned the example of the prophet who sprays people with insecticide. Now, he's, he's, he's a Christian. I, I don't doubt that. But I am loath to think that that kind of response to a situation of ailment and vulnerability not only undermines the integrity and the dignity of the human person, but also detracts us from issues around health care needs, infrastructure, or issues around political behavior and decision that make the provision of health care become impossible. So, um, and that's why, that's why, that's why my, my concern with pathology really comes in. And that's why I said it can be very dangerous. Amandi. Thank you. Um, you've talked of uh, this, uh, especially the Christians with uh, the prosperity gospel, taking selfies with the uh, God, eating stones. Now my question is, um, as a Jesuit and as a Christian, do you see any hope in eradicating these pathologies? Is there any hope for the Africans? What can be done? And what should we do? or even just to try and uh, 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 bring hope to the people who are so much exploited with uh, so called pathologies of the Thank you. Thank you, Mondi. Thank you. I, I, really, I really have hope, and I, and I will say this very strongly, because I believe that pathologies and the extreme manifestations in which they exist have a lifespan. I, I firmly believe that pathologies have a lifespan. You know, it was it uh, Bob Marley used to say, you can fool all the people, some people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all of the time, something like that. Because I think there is a realization that begins to develop, a consciousness that begins to grow. And I would say in our day and age of the vast technological opportunities that we now um, are benefited, benefiting from, I would say that that consciousness will grow because the lifespan of pathological, I would say, manifestation or performance tends to be very short. So while success is guaranteed at the moment for what I call the merchants of, of uh, pathological performance, that guarantee has a, a short lifespan. And, and because there are other voices in society that point out alternatives, or rather give uh, or, or offer alternative witness. And these voices also tend to be quite strong. So sociologically speaking and historically speaking, I think there is ground for hope, for change, uh, especially. Uh, when you think, for example, again, I, I give this as a very um, um, as an example, uh, in the context of, of West Africa, when we had the, the problem with Boko Haram, and Boko Haram came out and, 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 um, 
and and uh, for bad people to go to 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 embrace Western education and at at the onset, Boko Haram had quite a following in northeastern Nigeria amongst the local population. But it didn't take long for people to realize that they were also victims of this group that claimed to be based and founded on the tenets of their shared religious belief. It became very clear that the, the, the largest number of casualties of Boko Haram were not even Christians, they were Muslims. They were the biggest casualties of this. And so Muslims themselves in northeastern Nigeria turned against Boko Haram because they realized, contrary to what they thought, that this was not, this was in fact a pathological manifestation of the faith that they held quite deeply as believers, as Muslims. So I think that level of consciousness can develop very quickly and create and address very critical reactions to manifestations of pathology uh, in whatever religion, in whatever religion. So thank you. Um, I know Tom is going to come up and, and tell me to shut up, um, but, <laughs> but I just want to take this opportunity then to thank uh, Professor Tom Landy for the invitation. Uh, we go uh, uh, a few years back, and he has done an amazing job trying to create this platform for global conversations in Catholicism, and I want to thank him and his center for religion, ethics, and culture, for the invitation, and to the rest of your team, including Pat, uh, and, 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 and all of you, and to Professor Mary Roach, who invited me to our class this morning, and to your students. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you.